Right, good morning, everybody. Kia ora tato. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, come and talk to you here this morning. I understand we've got 20 minutes and you're going to be ringing the bell after 15, so I've got a whole pile of slides. As you can tell from my accent, I'm not from these fine shores, but I've been here 20 odd years. I've learned in those 20 years that I've got to try and talk a little bit slowly for most people to understand me, so I think I'm going to struggle to do that today, so apologies in advance, because there's quite a bit of, uh, of information that I'd like to try and get through here. So, with, with that um, introduction, um, what I'd like to do is, first of all, uh, provide a little bit of context about the ICCC, about who we are, what we've been asked to do, and then I'll go on to, which is the, the main course, which is to actually talk about uh, the analysis and some of the findings that, uh, that we are going to be coming out with, hopefully in two or three weeks' time. Most of you, I'm guessing, will be aware of the ICCC, but for those of you that aren't, or for those of you that need a reminder, I think it is just important just to set this context. Um, as we're aware, I won't go over that bullet point number one uh, here. I won't go through that uh, bullet point number one. We're all aware of what the targets uh, are, and it was so explicitly and eloquently laid out in the previous presentation there. The ICCC, so the Interim Committee for Climate Change, uh, was set up in advance of the proposed um, Climate Change Commission. Now, there was an expectation that the Zero Carbon Bill would have gone through by now. There has obviously been a delay to that process, which I'm sure you're all aware about. But the original intention was that the Interim Climate Change Committee would do the, do the work, and I'll talk about the, the two pieces of work that we've been asked to do. We'd produce our reports by the end of April 2019, i.e. in about 22 days' time, and that we would then pass our reports into the Interim Climate Change, uh, into the Climate Change Commission. That process of the appointment of the Commission has now been delayed. We will still finish our reports in uh, a couple of weeks' time, but we will hand them over to the government. So that really just provides a little bit of a context on ICCC. Uh, in terms of uh, who is on the committee, well, there's obviously myself. Of course, uh, the good Dr. Harry Clark needs absolutely no introduction uh, whatsoever, um, as will uh, many others on that committee. Uh, Jan, uh, Jan Wright, obviously, is the ex-commissioner for the environment, and Susie Kerr, I'm sure many of you um, know as well. Is Susie here? No, she isn't. No, she isn't. So I'd just like to just take this opportunity to again to, to thank my, uh, my fellow colleagues on the committee over the, the work that we've done over the past nine months. And I say that in the nicest possible way because I have got a caveat. Aside from not being from these fine shores, uh, I am a, a farmer by birth, actually. I spent the first 17 years of my life working on my, uh, my dad's farm in the southwest, southwest of Scotland before I went to Edinburgh to study engineering. So I'm a farmer by birth and an engineer by training. I'm not a researcher, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a climate expert. So I can promise you if anybody wants to ask me any tricky questions, I will be sending them over to Harry to help me out on that one. So Harry, I hope you're listening. Um, the two challenges, the two questions that we've actually were, were given, and I'll spend most of this presentation on the second question there, but the first question, reading between the lines, is effectively how do we transition to 100% renewable electricity by 2035? So let me just focus on that question now. And I, I, I realize that the vast majority of people in this room are interested in our work on that second question. I will spend the vast majority of the remaining time of this presentation on that, but I think it would be remiss of me not at least to talk about some of our thinking and some of our analysis around that question, because it is a very uh, critically important question. I've got about 15 slides on that one question alone, but what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to zip right to the end so that we can spend a bit more time on the agricultural question. So bear with me as I go through this. And, I, and by the way, as I go through this, as you can tell, there's a lot of information and a lot of data on here, which I'm not going to talk about today. Please feel free to ask any questions in the question session we've got. This, this presentation will be made available on our website in a couple of weeks' time, okay? just to let people know. But what I want to do is just go to this one slide here. I'm going to spend about three minutes talking to this slide and the following slide, which is our conclusions. So the question we were given is, how do we transition to 100% renewable electricity by 2035, which is an incredibly worthy question to have been asked. The, the reality is, uh, when you look at it, if you look at the renewable electricity that we've got here in New Zealand, it's somewhere between 82 and 85%. So we are incredibly blessed as a nation 
to already have a significant proportion of the electricity that's generated is generated from renewable sources. That's the first point. The second point is, if you actually look at the greenhouse gas emissions, purely from the electricity sector, it contributes about 5%. Okay? So while, as I said earlier, it's a very, very worthy question, and quite frankly, who wouldn't want all of our electricity to be generated from renewable sources? Who wouldn't want that? The reality is we felt that that question was somewhat narrow in the way that, was wor in the way that it was uh, worded, and we chose to look at it from a slightly wider perspective, which actually takes us right back to our Paris obligations, and our Paris obligations is all about how do we minimise greenhouse gas emissions as much as we possibly can? And that's how we chose to look at it. How can we minimise greenhouse gas emissions from the energy sector through intensive electrification and increase in generation? And what you've got there is effectively the results of the last nine months' worth of modelling and analysis that we did. So first of all, we looked at three modelling runs. So I'll give you the, the, the three key takeaway points here. If you just simply did a business-as-usual run, i.e. if we looked at the generation that we've got here in New Zealand and pretty much did nothing, then on the basis that the cost of solar and the cost of wind is coming down quite dramatically over the next 10 years, um, our modelling showed that we will get relatively comfortably to 93% renewable electricity by 2035 by effectively doing nothing. That's what we're on track for. Now, at 93%, um, as you can see from that, on the left-hand side, that's your business as usual. Um, at 93%, you've got approximately 3 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay? If we then say... Uh, let us go from that 93% and force the system up to 100, i.e. if we want to get to 100% renewable electricity, then how can we actually get there? And what we actually find that the cost to actually get us from 99 to 100 is prohibitively expensive, simply because we have to do a, a, an extensive overbuild of renewables to get us the required flexibility to get us through the dry winter period. So the key takeaway point is it is prohibitively expensive for us to try to get to 100% renewable electricity, both in terms of a marginal carbon cost of abatement, which goes over $1,200, and the retail price to the consumer, which goes up between 20 and 40%. Okay? So therefore, I'm going to move on quickly. I know you want to get on to agriculture. So therefore, um, we believe that a far better... Uh, solution for the government to look at is actually to look at the low-hanging fruit, and that is how do we achieve intensive electrification of the transport and the process heat sectors. And obviously to do that, we have got to build significantly more generation across the country. Somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of capacity will require, additional capacity will require to be constructed between now and 2035, which is a good problem, right? It's a good problem. That capacity, of course, will be renewable generation. And that will give us the opportunity to electrify up to 2.2 million vehicles uh, by 2035, which in turn leads to a net emissions reduction of 6 million tonnes, which by far and away is a far more pragmatic uh, solution to the challenge that we have got in front of us, which, as a reminder, is about emissions reduction. So that was it in a, in a nutshell. Normally when I'm doing that presentation, it takes about, about an hour to step through the key processes, but I probably don't have that time here just now. Very happy to answer questions on it, but I, I felt, uh, as I said earlier, that uh, I wouldn't be doing our work justice if I didn't at least give you guys a bit of an, up, an update on where we sit with that. But how much time have I got left? 10, 12 minutes, perfect. Um, so really the second question we were asked to look at is, is, and I'll read it out there, how surrender obligations could best be arranged if agricultural methane and nitrous oxide emissions enter into the NZETS? And again, similar to the question that we were given on electricity, we, we chose to, uh, to look at this question from a somewhat wider uh, perspective. So instead of limiting our analysis of purely on using the, uh, the NZETS, as a potential pricing mechanism, we actually looked at others, uh, other ways of doing that, and I'll talk about that uh, now. Just in terms of the process that we went through, I, I, I would like to acknowledge um, 
a group that we put together from the start, and we called that Ag Charge. And that really stands for Agriculture Challenge and Review Group. And that was a group that we put together which was based on the Bear Group. So we had representatives from the key sector bodies, Dairy NZ, um, Fonterra, Beef and Lamb, the Deer Association, etc., etc. And we worked with that group over the past nine months to really challenge us, uh, to really help us understand some of the key complexities, challenges, difficulties and opportunities. And I know that there are a few representatives of that group in here. And I do want to acknowledge uh, uh, your support and challenge that you've provided us over the past uh, nine months. In terms of coming up with the analysis we have and the process that we went through, what we also did is, is we also had a number of rural workshops uh, that we ran in February of this year, uh, where we got a, a, a group of farmers together in five separate locations around the country. And we presented some of our thinking and some of our options to those farmers. So a lot of where we have, has, have landed today with respect to what will be our recommendations, again, uh, is based on the feedback from those workshops that we had around the country. So in terms of the process that we went through, we, we kind of split it up into two, into two broad areas. One is uh, driving change. So actually, how do we drive change? How do we dri drive the behavioral change that, that's required? that are actually going to get us the results that the, the previous speaker was talking about. And we looked at NZETS and other pricing policies, we looked at regulatory limits, and we looked at mandated good management practice and looked at the pros and cons of each. But as, as important to that, you can't just drive change without actually providing a support mechanism to, to ensure that, that the, uh, as many opportunities are there for farmers going forward and that the transition, the transition to a low carbon economy is as smooth as it possibly can be. And um, we looked at uh, a number of different ways of doing that, so farm environment plans, um, dedicated agriculture emissions fund, and support for rural professionals. And I'll talk about all those things in the remaining slides that we've got. So first of all, in terms of the process that we went through, in preparing the sector to reduce on-farm emissions, well, one of the first things that need to be done before we can even worry about pricing emissions, we've actually got to have some clear, pragmatic, simple way of actually being able to record and monitor the emissions at farm level going forward. And at present, as you can see from bullet point number two, while many, many farmers that we hear from around the country are doing a, a fantastic job in already reducing on-farm emissions, and that's one thing, by the way, that I will see in talking to a lot of farmers. One of the key points of feedback that we had, and one of the key points of frustration from those farmers was, for crying out loud, will you give us the due that we think we, are, we deserve? And I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, if you look at the emissions that, that from the farming sector over the last 20 years, farmers have done an incredible job. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But they're going through a pretty hard time at present. And I think it's important that we recognize and acknowledge the work that they have done up until now. And that's the point of that second bullet point there. But the key point is, if we are going to, if we are going to mandate a nationwide um, emissions reduction scheme from the uh, agricultural sector going forward, then we need to have a far more consistent way of doing that. And to cut a long story short, having heard from the farmers, we believe that integrating emissions management into farm environment plans will far better help us enable this. And we're also aware that farm environment plans is, is, is something that uh, uh, many farmers are talking about. And I know that many farmers in various parts of the country are actually using at present. But really the question is, how do we actually roll that out nationally? And I'll talk about that, talk about that transition because it's a key point, and the timing of that transition in the last slide that I've got. But farm environment plans, uh, we believe, are the, are the way forward. So if we've got the farm environment plan there, then there are a number of different ways of actually regulating uh, emissions. We considered a range of pros and cons. Um, and again, to cut a long story short, um, uh, we looked at a number of kind of rules-based options with respect to regulating policy, uh, policies, but, but the strong feedback that we had from certainly most people that we talked to was a well-designed um, emissions pricing policy uh, will be far more cost-effective at uh, delivering, uh, delivering emissions reductions. Um, and, and I guess that the key reason for that is that um, pricing creates an external market driver. So really it makes good financial sense then for farmers uh, to reduce emissions. Now the key point, uh, uh, there's a couple of key points in those bottom two bullet points there. To be most effective, to be most effective, that accountability for livestock emissions must be at farm gate level. So farmers must feel as if they've got the full flexibility to actually control their own destinies and actually look for significant opportunities out there. But 
must be at farm gate uh, level. And for emissions from fertilizer, I've been primarily talking about livestock emissions there, but for, um, from emissions from fertilizer, uh, we as the committee, we believe that the added level of complexity at farm level is not warranted or not justified because we believe that it's better to continue to be priced through the NZ ETS at processor level. And again, the feedback from, from most would uh, support that. So in terms of pricing, if, if we've agreed that we've got uh, a farm environment plan to actually kind of provide the framework, and we've uh, come to the conclusion that a, a pricing policy is the best way to actually regulate that going forward, then we believe that any farm level pricing policy should minimize red tape and complex complexity. It needs to be simple, it needs to be pragmatic, it needs to be easily understood by the 20 or 30,000 farmers around this country. And therefore, we, we believe at the moment that the ETS is, is not the best way to do that because we couldn't see a pragmatic and, and simple way to have 20 or 30,000 farmers trading carbon on the ETS. So we believe the simplest way to price emissions is through a levy rebate scheme, which is a far simpler, more familiar and pragmatic for farmers than a trading scheme. Now, the key point here is that it is many ways similar to an ETS in such that the levy rate would be tied to an ETS uh, price. So you've still got that external carbon price that comes through the ETS that is driving the necessary pricing behavior, but the way that it's administered is through an, a levy and a rebate scheme. The key issue there is the appropriateness, the, the appropriateness excuse me, of putting the full cost burden on the 20 or 30,000 uh, mostly small and medium-sized family farming businesses. Now, this last bullet point, I've been a little bit uh, cheeky here because when our report comes out, the most complicated and the biggest chapter of our report uh, will be on this question of free allocation. And I've covered that off in one bullet point <laughs> because really to actually do it justice here today, we'd probably need at least a couple of hours to talk through it in detail. So I would encourage you all, please, when our report comes out to have a look at this because this really, really is a key point. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, the government through the coalition agreement has already made the decision that we will transition to it from, a, from 100, so the agricultural sector, sorry, uh, will transition from 100% free allocation to 95% free allocation. The way that that 95% free allocation is administered and distributed is absolutely critical because it can drive a number of very different outcomes. And we have looked at, uh, at, least, at least five different methods of distributing uh, that free allocation. All of them have pros and cons. I'm not gonna go into that just now because it will be a government decision ultimately, but I think in consultation with the sector going forward. Uh, but that is a key point that certainly needs to be um, um, worked on um, further. And as I said, what our report will hopefully do is set out, um, set out the context around that. It will set out the pros and cons, and it will set out where we as a committee believe uh, it, it, it is the correct path um, to go down. The transition, the last, the last point I really want to talk about, I think I'm okay for time. Yeah, the last point I really want to talk about is, is this question of transition. So as I said um, right at the start of this agricultural question, um, ultimately what we uh, believe we need to do is move as quickly as possible as we can to a farm level um, a system of having farm environmental plans there. That of course is far easier said than done and our analysis would indicate that that's going to take somewhere up to five years to actually get in place, in place across the, uh, the agricultural sector here in New Zealand which then raises the question, what is it that we do in the meantime? And I guess there's, there's two opposite sides of the spectrum. There's kind of two things that we've, we've looked at and very, very, very keen to get everybody's feedback um, here today. But, but certainly you could say, well, let's do nothing. Let's do nothing for, for five years. Let's work, let the government work with the sector and work with the experts to actually design a scheme such that by 2025, we have got uh, nationwide um, farm, envi farm environmental plans in place and we can start um, measuring and pricing emissions reduction then. We believe that's too late. We believe uh, that we actually need to be doing something now. And therefore, 
what we can do now, unfortunately, is somewhat limited because I said, as I said at the start, one of the key points of feedback that came back to us is that uh, whatever needs to happen, whatever the pricing mechanism is, make sure it's at the farm gate, which gives the farmer the ultimate flexibility to actually do something. The problem is we, it's very difficult to actually do that in the short term. So um, we believe that in the short term, pricing emissions mod modestly through the NZETS at a processor level will create the right price signal and so provide planning certainty for farmers and the wider sectors. It is imperfect. It categorically is imperfect, but we believe the benefits of that outweigh actually waiting to get something perfect in place by 2025 because we need to send that signal and we need to get something going now. Processor level pricing will be needed only for the next three to five years while on-farm systems are established. So what that, if we go down that path and we believe that that's the right thing to do, uh, then pricing agriculture, uh, sorry, pricing agriculture emissions is obviously a significant change and the transition is going to be key. And that kind of comes back to the 95% free allocation, uh, which again uh, is, is a coalition government de uh, decision. And that in itself will help that transition you know, because you're not going from 100 to zero in the space of, of uh, you know, a weekend. Uh, but we need to be very, very astutely aware of some of, the, uh, some of the challenges that we're going to have, but as importantly, some of the opportunities that we've got and make sure that transition is planned as well as possible. So any funds, so um, any funds that therefore will be collected or are collected any, uh, through the support uh, we believe need to be dedicated, sorry, uh, w uh, sh should be going into a new um, dedicated fund. Uh, we believe we need to develop a greenhouse gas module for farm environmental, farm environmental plans and also good management practice for emissions. Uh, that fund will also uh, support extension and training and it will uh, fund research and development. But the key point there is the word in that, uh, I don't think it is there, yes it is, in that second bullet point, that it is a dedicated fund that it is ministered by a separate body that will need to be set up to ensure that any funds collected are fed back into the farming sector to support them through the transition over the next um, five years. So in conclusion, uh, extensive uh, management needs to be part of uh, uh, ongoing farm management. We believe farm environmental plans will be crucial to enabling that. We believe pricing is the most cost-effective tool for reducing emissions at farm level through a levy stroke rebate for livestock. Uh, and in the short term, as we, work in, as we work through that in parallel with a process for 2025, the short term through processors via the ETS. And at the processor level uh, via the ETS for nitrogen fertilizer. And then lastly, we will be recommending a dedicated fund that is set up to encourage the significant required significant required uh, reduction, sorry, that's uh, wrong wording there, of on-farm emissions. So this is my last slide. Doing okay still? Yep. Brilliant. Okay, um, I thought it was probably just a good idea to, to give you a bit of a heads up on where next from here. So we will be finalizing our report, as I said, both, both our reports by, by the end of April, at which stage we'll hand them over uh, to the government for consideration. And I must, again, clearly state that it, it is for the government to consider any advice and recommendations and how those are implemented or not. Um, we will then, we as an ICCC have been asked to uh, continue doing some work on something called plausible pathways. And that's partly because the decision's been made uh, because there has been a delay in the setting up of the commission that the government is keen to continue some momentum in this area and so I've asked the ICCC as I said, to continue in its current form, but to start to look at the plausible pathways. And plausible pathways in simple terms are basically saying, well, if we know what the target is going to be like, which hopefully we'll get through the zero, zero carbon bill, we'll know where we need to get to by 2025. We know where we are just now. So for the various sectors, whether we're talking agriculture, or whether we're talking in the energy sector or the transport sector, what is a plausible pathway and what steps could be, stroke should be done to get us from there to there? And it is that type of analysis which will, which will actually underpin the carbon budgeting going forward, which will ultimately uh, sit with the Climate Commission. So that's what the focus of the ICCC will be uh, uh, going forward. 
As I've said, the zero carbon bill is expected to be announced, uh, oh sorry, excuse me, expected to be introduced to Parliament in May, and that provides the legislative framework around what that 2050 target will look like and also provides confirmation of the form and function of the Climate Commission. MFE will then start uh, a consultation on our um, agricultural recommendations. That's expected to be uh, mid-2019. And then finally, the Climate Change Response Amendment Bill, effectively the ETS, is expected in late 2019 as well, which will provide, I guess, the, the framework, the tools and the policies. So that was a, a, a very, thank you all very much. That was a very uh, swift uh, uh, run through, um, but hopefully I've managed to get the, the key points across. Thank you very much. <clears throat>